It is a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Ronald McGlennon, an MD pathologist, and he is the founder of OralDNA.com. I'm so excited he accepted to be on my show today. This is absolutely mind-boggling stuff he's been doing. Dr. McGlennon is president and medical director of Access Genetics and Oral DNA Labs. He has published more than 75 articles and book chapters and has served as an editor of five journals. He holds nine issued patents. He is board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology and also by the American Board of Medical Genetics with a specialty in clinical molecular genetics. He is internationally recognized as an expert in molecular biology and genetics. His focus in research has been on reducing the complexity of gene-based testing, including DNA chip technology and simple analytic instrumentation to better serve the community laboratory. He has served on a series of governmental and regulatory committees focused on the growth of the field of molecular diagnostics. Through his interest in oral DNA labs, he hopes to bring the power of the clinical lab to the forward-reaching dental practice. This is like Star Wars stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it, it used to be Star Wars. It's actually still meat and potato medicine. Is it really? It is. And I think that's what we have to start this conversation with, Howard. It's meat and potato because whether we're talking about genetics or measuring a blood marker, you know, the laboratory is, is central to how we make modern diagnoses. It's how we... It's how we take care of patients and surveil what is working and what's not working in terms of therapy. And increasingly, it's about what we share with patients before they have evidence of disease. So we prevent, we diagnose, we prognose, we monitor. All these things happen through the kinds of stuff that we bring to you as a clinician in the clinical laboratory. So. The Star Wars part, you know, is discussion about DNA. And I guess maybe I have a little bit of a different perspective. I've been doing this for 25 years. And I remember when my mentor told me, you know, if you want to waste your time in your career worrying about DNA, so be it. But here <laughs> I am 25 years later, and, and it's really becoming part of the everyday conversation. So don't be overwhelmed by the idea of molecular or DNA Let's just talk about what that kind of information does to take care of patients. So the United States has uh, 211,000 Americans are alive in America today with a license to practice dentistry, and there's a million physicians. Would you say that dentists use DNA testing and molecular genetics uh, a lot less than their MD counterparts? Yeah, the term a lot less doesn't even begin to fit onto the scale. And, and so without a question, my mission in my career, notwithstanding my business, is to provide quality DNA and, if you will, laboratory testing. But sort of shoulder to shoulder with that mission is to bring to the world of dentistry some of the, the very important principles that most physicians use every single day. They start conversations with patients, they order a lab test, they amalgamate that information, and together with their clinical exam plus this laboratory information, they reach a higher level of understanding. I do not believe we have that in dentistry, and it is part of my mission to help that come to be realized. Well, well one way to fix that mission or create an online CE course on Dentaltown to show them you know, the, how, you know, they could be physicians of the, of the mouth instead of uh, working with their hands and just being surgeons all day. I mean, mo most of them think they're helping you if they have a burr going on your tooth and they're, you know, they're, they're fixing a tooth and you're telling them to stand back and be more like a physician and order tests. You know, one of the beauties about dentistry that, you know, a physician doesn't fully appreciate is, is the art of it all and, and the art of, not only the therapy that you apply, but the very pointed clinical exam. I'm not in any way dismissing the significance of that. Rather, to the contrary, I wish physicians would spend more time in the physical exam and, and, and less perhaps on the reliance of outside information. But we live in a time when we can see much, much deeper into the disease process if we incorporate some of these tools. So that's why we've used some of the things that sort of bring this into a more familiar context. We talk about our DNA-based testing as molecular x-rays. I know it's a word, it's a phrase, but frankly, it sort of brings it into the context because most dentists do use x-rays. They can see into bone and to structure, and they can look for pockets of infection. 
beyond that, the laboratory can start to tell you what is the nature of that infection and what is the severity and is it actually just an empty pocket or is it filled with pus and all these things that your eyes can't do, your x-ray machines can't do, so bring in this other set of tools to make it all more enhanced. I've been interested in DNA uh, based testing because uh, my four boys are uh, 21, 23, 25, 27, and they're all taller than me and good looking, so now I'm wondering if they're even my children. You understate your you understate your good looks. I think uh, Ryan. I think I might not be your father. He's six foot tall. How could this five seven short guy have a six foot tall son? Um, so we call so, them a mutation. <laughs> they're mutations. The reason the show's an hour is because uh, they all have an hour commute to work. So they're they're driving to work right now. Start walking through walking them through real life dental clinical scenarios, and uh, where they should be. Um, doing this and and would they would they do this on your website oraldna.com that's correct so on our website oraldna.com there is an opportunity to then log into our secured portal which is where we communicate back and forth laboratory results the process by which oral dna becomes part of your practice is a simple phone call to our customer service they'll send you out some collection kits some instructional material embedded into an introductory email and you're up and running. Okay, so is, it's there, a very, is this just all, all saliva or is there blood? Any what, what fluids are you testing? Right now, it's saliva, and I guess to be more specific, it's saliva with some salt water. So we call it an oral rinse. So let's start there. Let's start there. We collect a sample of saliva admixed with five milliliters of, of saline. So what does that tell us? Well, in that collection, if you close your eyes and imagine what it is, don't close your eyes if you're driving to work, <laughs> you're going to be collecting some of the sloughed epithelial cells. In those epithelial cells from the patient is the DNA material in every single copy of those cells that makes up our entire genome. So that tells us a lot about why we're tall and short and whether or not you challenge your boy's you know, parentage. <laughs> Okay, now also in that sample is bacteria. Bacteria have DNA also, and so we can get at that, that DNA from that same collection. Also in that sample are fungi and viruses, and we're gonna talk about each of those cell types in, in, in sequence here. Let's start with the bacteria. So many of us are familiar with clinical microbiology, that is, stick a paper point below the gum line and let it dwell there for a few seconds. Bacteria will adhere to that, that material and then you can send it off to a laboratory and using a lot of specialized techniques of broths and cultures and some biochemicals, you might be able to ferret out which bacteria are present. Some of those bacteria are good, some of those bacteria are bad. So by conventional microbiology, we have some opportunity to find out who the good and bad bugs are. With DNA technology, the process is vastly simpler. DNA is very durable. It transports readily from the chair side to the FedEx box to the clinical laboratory, so don't worry so much about degraded sample, whether it's misrepresenting one species versus another. So putting that oral rinse sample into a tube and shipping it off to the laboratory is a cross-section, is a view, of what bugs are present in that patient's mouth. Then we use the power of our testing technology to sort and quantify the good and the bad bugs. The same sample is a good place to collect human DNA. And so let's talk about what human DNA might tell us about oral pathology. Well, I mean, we have an immune system and we know that by definition, periodontal disease is is more than just the presence of the bacteria, it's the body's response to that bacteria. We are different between us as individuals in the pronouncement of that severity of inflammation. Some people are have their thermostat turned up way high, so they have a lot of inflammation, and some people have a more sort of normal or demure inflammatory response. And we could go down the list and say, what are we looking for? Bugs, viruses, fungi, or something in the human genome. 
Simple collection process goes off the lab. So let's walk that sample through. You go online, you enter in the patient information. You say it's a 50-year-old male. He's got mild, moderate, severe periodontal disease. You've done so by placing that ADA classification. Maybe you've measured pocket depth. You tell us something about that patient. Is they, are they diabetic? Do they have heart disease? Are they a smoker? Are they on an antibiotic? Are there other medications that we can bring into the whole picture? That gets transmitted through our web portal in a secured fashion. The sample collected at the chair side gets sent off by FedEx, and they meet here at our laboratory in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. We open up the bag. The first step in that journey is to take from that sample of saline and saliva, spin it down, and we're going to get DNA. DNA from the cells, DNA from the bugs, DNA from the viruses. Generally, what we do with that DNA is subjected to a, a particular technology called polymerase chain reaction. It's a way that we can target selected regions of those genes or genomes and raise them up to a level of dimension or quantity that we can then readily measure them, analyze them, look at their sequence and, and whatnot. I look at that information along with my colleagues who are expert in this area, and we assemble a laboratory report. We hit a button on our computer, and the next thing is it appears on your web portal in your office instantaneously. Everything between collection and report is all about the work we do for you. We want to be viewed as a partner to your practice. So we strive to do it as fast as possible, two to three days between collection to answer, including the transport. We're available to consult about what that, those answers mean, but we'll get to those answers now. One of the tests that we offer measures those bacteria which are known to be pathogenic or pathogens that cause periodontal disease. You've told us that this patient has swelling, maybe some, some uh, enhanced pocket depth, maybe the x-rays show some bone loss, but you do not know the nature of that infection. These test reports will tell you the nature of that infection, which bacteria are involved, what's their quantity. From that information, we'll tell you, amongst other things, that there are some choices of antibiotics that can be used. It's not one, one size fits all. There are a matrix of maybe 10 or 15 different drugs in different combinations for different regimens. And so the bacterial profile or the bacterial signature, which is frankly unique to every patient, will have a unique or personalized answer for your therapeutic action. Let me underscore that one more time. We live in an era of personalized medicine. But when you talk about that, in sort of general terms, people kind of, their eyes kind of glass over. But here's a very specific example when you're talking to your patients. I am doing this test to identify the precise and customized therapy that will be useful to cure your infection. That's a great example of personalized medicine. It's as cutting edge as anything we would talk about in cancer therapy or, or other advanced disease states. So keep that in mind. When you do this type of testing, you are personalizing medicine for your patient. If a physician saw 100 patients, an MD, out of those 100, how many would they run tests? As for blood, urine, something to test. My experience, about 100, maybe 99. And if a, hundred, and if a dentist saw 100 patients, how many of them would she order tests on? Three or four. And where do you think that that's going to be uh, in the future? Through our efforts, 50 or 60. And how much is that test? Well, the test to the dental community is $99. The opportunity to the dentist is whatever you, you market to and whatever you sell it to your patients at. Uh, we don't have really qualified data, but we know that it runs around $150 to, to the patient themselves. Are any dental insurance companies starting to cover this? Yes, and medical insurance companies as well. And as part of 
the transmission of these results, we share with you the, the codes that you might apply for dental insurance or medical insurance. Since our business relationship with all of the, the dental community is, is through credit card or cash, you know, that transaction with insurance is, is, your, is your advantage, but um, we provide you with that information to help you code this. How many dentists are using your services now, would you say? Well, it's really exciting is we've got about 6,000 dentists uh, across the United States that are active participants in our, in our laboratory services. What's even more exciting is, is that about two or three offices are signing up per day. Nice. And I think we do a really good job of taking care of, of our customers, uh, not only through friendly and, and user-friendly uh, approaches towards signing up, but just the simple convenience of running samples through, getting results. And when you need us, we have instantaneous response to consultation. We'll look things up. We'll do background work. You know, let me talk about that for a moment. You know, I have no pretense here that the handful of tests that we offer are going to cover the waterfront for all questions that, that a dentist might experience. But let's be very clear. You sit, the dentistry community sits in a very privileged chair. They see patients who come with a host of conditions, and they may be more hesitant than, than you, you know to go to their physician to, to get that diagnosis of diabetes or high blood pressure and maybe even a malignant process. So you sit in a privileged position where you can ask questions. And through some of these laboratory tests, you can start to identify not only what's going on in the mouth, but what's going on elsewhere in the body? So let's go back to the topic we were just talking about, measuring bacteria that are causal for periodontitis. I hope there's no questions from your audience that these same bacteria are through a process of time and quantity, they leach into the bloodstream. They cause transient bacteremia. And those bacteria fall on end organs that include the coronary vessels, the brain vessels, the pancreas, and if you will, even, even uh, uh, our joints. These are causes of systemic disease. And so there's much to be talked about in terms of the role that these oral bacteria play in the initiation and the progression of atherosclerosis, of type 2 diabetes, of the various arthritides. So we live in a day when we talk about the oral systemic connection. And the dentists who are on the vanguard of this have formed organizations that are very much in discussion about this. How does the dentist play a role in finding this disease earlier on in younger people? So let's talk next about where we're going with this. I just shared with you an example of how you might use this test to confirm a diagnosis of periodontal disease. But let's be very clear. There are people out there who do not have clinically observable periodontitis who have these same bugs. And you owe it to them to bring it to their attention that they are also at risk for these chronic diseases. Part of personalized medicine is preventative medicine. Our job is to find that 20-year-old who is going to have heart disease at age 50, who doesn't feel it now, but has an opportunity to start changing their lifestyle, their diet, and so on, to then stave off some of these chronic disorders. This is the new vanguard of medicine, and it starts where the play, in the place where most people get their first foray into healthcare, their dental office. So it's a privileged position that takes on a whole new scope of responsibility and all it really takes is to start a conversation with us, start a conversation with me and, and we'll walk down this path together. On Dental Town, uh, there's a quarter million member dentists on here and there's 50 categories, root canals, fillings, crowns, what have you. But under health, we have a thread, uh, we have a section called the oral systemic health and it has exploded on Dental Town. And it's exploded with a lot of controversy because some, um, in fact, I wish you would just spend, oh my God, if you would just spend a day 
going through these oral systemic health as an MD pathologist. Plus, whenever you answered a question in your signature, they'd see who you are and that you're an MD and a link to your website and all that stuff. But I mean, um, the periodontist can't even agree if periodontal disease is really associated uh, with other parts of the body. What, what, would, what would you say to those people um, who say um, it's possible, it's probable, it might be all be true, but there's zero evidence that there's any association with this stuff? Well, first of all, I would I would simply stop that sentence by saying there is there is zero evidence. There is ample evidence, but let's put it into right perspective because I think you're absolutely correct. Um, part of the responsibility of understanding how to use the clinical laboratory and to assemble a larger portfolio of data around your patients and around patients at large is to know how to interpret this information. So let's start with a couple of vocabulary words: risk. What does, it, what does risk really mean? We, we grew up and we went to school in medical schools and in dental schools where we talk about patient comes, they have disease, get rid of the disease. So the presumption there is, is that they come to you with some degree of illness. But now we live in an era where with, through these tools, x-rays and molecular tools, we can see disease at its very incipient forms. And sometimes the progression from the initiation to clinically you know, symptomatic disease may be measured in decades. So does that mean we just dismiss the conversation because it's not gonna affect us between now and when they come back? No, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to do it. So talking about risk, I urge all of our listeners to talk about things like um, um, odds ratios and and Wilcox test. You have to become familiar with those terms so that when you talk about them with your patients, they come out coherently. Risk means risk. You have to think of the world in terms of large populations and how that plays out through individuals. And through that vantage is how you communicate to patients. So let me give you a scenario. What do you say to a 25 year old who smokes a half a pack a day and you were to measure these bacterial pathogens to find that they have elevated levels of Porphyrmonas gingivalis. So you're not there to tell that guy he's gonna have a heart attack in the next year. That's very, very unlikely. But you have to find ways to communicate words like you are at risk. P. gingivalis plus your smoking plus your lipids gives you the full package of your disease likelihood. And you can affect some of those things and some of those things are harder to affect. Let me give you a more succinct example. Dentistry is very interested in the role they play in oral cancer. Hey. Finding. You put your finger in their mouth, you run around, you feel for lumps and bumps, right? Did that bump change over three months, six months, etc.? Now we have a test that identifies the virus that is a identified in 65 to 70% of oral cancers. I'm gonna use a, a phrasing here which is sort of common to my, my personality, which is in the old days, 50s and 60s perhaps, laryngeal cancer, uh, oral cancers were old man smoking drinking disease, right? You smoke too much, you drink too much, and if you get old enough, you might get one of these oral cancers. That equation has changed. Oral cancer is a disease of the third and fourth decade of life. It affects men and women. And the cause of that is an infectious process. That infectious process starts somewhere. And in some people, it goes nowhere, no, nowhere clinically important. But in some proportion, it goes to a very bad place. How will you know unless you test? How will you know? And then when you have that piece of information, a positive HPV test, what does that mean? That patient is at risk. Is it a huge risk? No. You need to have some perspective on that. And I can provide that. The literature will certainly share that. But you have done that patient a great service by telling them that you should not have multiple sex partners or you should surveil that infection until it goes away. And because you have it, means that you might need at some point some more sort of deliberate investigation of lumps and bumps in your mouth. It's that simple. 
We're not saying change your life totally, but we're saying we've got a piece of information. We can judiciously use it to manage your care long term. Risk is central to that conversation. What I don't understand about Dennis is that if when women went to their uh, OBGYN or uh, their doctor and they stopped doing cancer screenings for uh, their parts below the waist, I mean, people would think that was crazy. But then all those girls go to their dentist and almost none of them uh, do oral cancer exams in, in the mouth. Why, why are dentists so out there? I mean, could, what percent of female doctors test for cancer, vaginal, uterine, when they go in for a physical? Well, okay, so there's two, two parts to that, that answer. And uh, so we're talking about the gynecologic community, and the answer is 100% of them are involved in some way in using a pap smear or HPV. And HPV comes on the scene about 20 years ago and is standard of care. It would be, frankly, malpractice not to, to surveil that. So you make an excellent reference we refer to it as below the belt and above the belt. And let's be very clear. What happens below the belt also happens above the belt. So there is no reason to not start that conversation. The second part of your question is, is you don't, you don't get on to the topic unless you ask that initial question. Patients are actually very open to the topic of oral sex. And they will share that with you. But the professional in the room has to initiate that conversation. So don't be afraid to ask the qu simple question. Tell me, a, would you mind sharing your sexual history? Have you engaged in oral sex? Have you had multiple partners? Have you noticed anything? Do you have any concerns? And when you do that, you'll find not only an important and intimate uh, component to the relationship you have with your patient, but they will be very forthcoming about saying, yes, I do have concerns because they've heard the stories, movie stars and friends in the middle or prime of their life now coming up with a disease that used to be old man smoking drinking disease. That changes the dimension. Again, you have an opportunity to really have a meaningful engagement with your patient through a simple uh, request of that those types of questions. I know, but I'm, I'm going to tell you reality. I mean, Ron, I've lectured 1,000 times in America since 1990. 1,000 times. Um, I So many dentists in Texas and Kentucky and Tennessee and Kansas and Oklahoma, I mean, they're just, they'd be mortified. I mean, just that they, they probably even never said the word oral sex for. In fact, it's probably hard for them to say oral DNA. They're, you know, <laughs> they're like, Oral DNA, or uh, so I mean, how would how, how talk to those guys? You have a professional responsibility to enhance health, whatever your focus is. I mean, that's that's sort of the altruistic side of it. I think, on if you will, a practical, if not an economically driven side, I don't think there is any evidence to suggest that by asking important, intimate, and expansive questions to your patients will do anything but enhance your practice. It will bring more patients in your door. They will trust you more. They will appreciate your, your humble and, and noble approach towards the broader perspective of their health. The mouth is a window to the rest of their body. It always gripes your gears when someone says, oh, you're a dentist, you're not a real doctor. And you know, and you know, there's jokes out there, like I'd always say like, well, you know, Dr. Pepper's not a real doctor. Uh, Dr. Dre's not a real doctor. Uh, but the bottom line is they're not a real doctor because like we were saying, if you went, if a hundred women went to a hundred gynecologists, they'd all get tests done for this. If those same hundred women went to their dentist, what percent of them would ask questions or run tests on them? Well, I mean, if you want to put the responsibility wholly onto the patients, then that number will remain very small. A few percentage of them will come forward because they're not used to the experience of having a dentist sort of open up the dialogue of a host of things beyond teeth and gums, okay? But I can give you my solemn assurance that if you ask as the professional, if you ask the first question, you will be rewarded by a lot of people opening up. I have the very same doctors, and uh, these are head and neck surgeons and, and oral maxillary surgeons, who a few years ago were chiding me for making an oral HPV test available, saying, what are you doing filling my office with worried well people? 
Today, those conversations have completely reversed. They're thanking me, saying, you know what, I'm identifying a few cancers. I'm really opening up this dialogue. So from where I sit as a pathologist, I am gratified by the service that we can now expand and extend to this host of new questions. It's important. The famous people that came out with the oral cancer and tying it to oral sex, that was uh, Michael Douglas, right? Right. And then there was a, uh, there's a lot of talk also about a famous uh, uh, Buffalo Bills football player. You know who I'm talking about? I'm afraid I don't. Uh, but, but who's the Buffalo Bills? Anyway, they're, they're, they're talking to him, trying to get him uh, uh, to come out and talk about it. But uh, I don't know if they're there yet. Um, so so uh, you talked about perio. Uh, you talked about HPV. Uh, and I, I've been ranting for years that I think it's insane when about 8,000 to 38,000 people die of the flu each year. And you look at those people and say, what was their last point of entry to the healthcare system? And mm-hmm. dentistry is first, second, or third. And here's, mm-hmm. here's a dentist and a hygienist cleaning her teeth. And I mean, what's the chance she's going to die from not getting her teeth cleaned next six months? Why don't you give them a flu shot? But in, the state, but in every state except one, except for Tennessee, uh, you can go to CVS or Walgreens and a pharmacy tech with nine months of school can give you a flu shot or an HPV vaccine. And me, with nine years of college, it's against the law for me to give a flu shot. Dentistry, and th- this is why I am um, so honored that you would come on my show, because dentists need to get the right for flu shots. They need to get the right for HPV vaccines. They need to start running molecular tests like real doctors. They, they need to be physicians of the oral mouth, or they need to just sit there and say, hey, I'm a molar mechanic. I'm not a doctor. I'm a, I'm a tooth mechanic. And if you have any doctor questions, you're going to need to see your old doctor. I mean, they, they need to differentiate themselves. Are they going to be mechanics? Are they just going to be tooth jockeys? Are they going to be doctors? Well, I appreciate that. And I, I just wanted to comment that you know, a lot of people say to me as a pathologist, you know, what do I know about patient care? I don't see patients face on face. It's an attitude. It's a perspective. It's a, it's a, it's a mission. And so I know that people listening to us right now uh, will resonate when I say you went into this for more than just a handful of things that you see every day. Expand your your careers, expand your mind, and expand your scope of influence through the simple step of an opening your sort of doors to bringing in outside information that give us new perspectives on on what you can do for patient care. And so let me highlight some of the things that we're not presently doing today but we'll be doing in the near future through a laboratory service, which quite frankly is dedicated, devoted to the dental profession. I wanna be very clear. We are a laboratory of the highest professional caliber. So I won't recite them, but all the credentials that we hang on our walls qualify us to say that we are validated, we are tested, we are compared. So you can trust us that what we're doing is the top of the line medicine. And so for that reason, we have a menu that has eight or nine different tests that you can order today. Periodontal disease, inflammation profiles, viruses, other types of bacterial infections of the mouth. But in the future, you make a point. Why wouldn't a woman concerned about Zika infection a new epidemic in this continent might have her first interface with healthcare through a test that could be offered out of the dental office. Why not? Is that to suggest that the dentist is not qualified to talk about the very next step, which is you're positive or you're negative, you're positive, maybe you need to go see your internist, maybe you need to go see an infectious disease doctor. It's not that tough. But think of the a number of conversations in the broader scope of topics we take on. We also know that there are a lot of things that you do in dentistry that are influenced by diseases ongoing in the body. And so, of course, there's conversation about measuring spot glucose and looking at blood pressures and maybe looking at reactive uh, or inflammatory proteins. All these things can be done methodologically, so simplistically, from a saliva collection. And so that's what the future brings for making dentists a bigger player, a bigger participant in the medical community, doctors of the mouth, if you will. We'll help you. 
So you said right now you do nine tests? That's correct, yes. Well, you go through all nine. You just said three of them. Sure. Go, go so, through all nine. We talked about the bacterial test, and we have a couple of new versions of that bacterial test which get even more specific. And so um, uh, we look, for example, at P. gingivalis and its various isotypes. We know that it's one bacteria doesn't explain it all. Sometimes there are strains that are more pathogenic than others. That helps in explain cases where the initial test, the so-called myperiopath, doesn't answer all the questions. The second area of testing uh, is the human, geno human genome. We have a couple of uh, menu items and they are entitled tests like uh, my perio ID is one name and the other one is called Celsus one and I'll get to why that is named in a moment this is looking at a profile of human genes a profile that identifies those who have a tendency or a proclivity to have a more pronounced infl inflammatory response you've got relatively few bacteria to explain a case of periodontal disease. Well, many of my colleagues point out that individual is having a very pronounced inflammation to a relative paucity of bacteria. That explains that patient against the backdrop of the so many who have high levels of bacteria. That's one application. So Celsus-1 and my period ID. Why do we call it Celsus-1? I'll tell you why. I know why. It, it's Please, you looked it up, didn't you? No, Who's no, you're in Minnesota, and uh, my oldest sister's in a nut is a in a nunnery in Lake Elmo, and I think it's uh, absolute zero is minus two hundred seventy three degrees Celsius, and that's <laughs> probably the average temperature there in January. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> it used to be when I was growing up, but not so much anymore. We struggle sometimes to get it below freezing, but close. But it's not Celsius; it's Celsius. Okay. Okay. Celsus is from the Roman time. He was uh, an encyclopedist and a physician, and he is the one who coined the Caller Ruber Tumor Dolor. You know what that is? Uh, tenderness, red swelling, tenderness Absolutely. plus or pain. You pass the four cardinal signs of inflammation. Go through them. So Celsus is named after a test that is looking at inflammation. And so whimsically, it's about those four cardinal signs of inflammation. And what, what were they? What, go through the four in, in Latin. Calor, like calories. Calor. Do like calories. Pain. Pain. Ruber, redness. Let's see. Calor, dolor, rub, tumor. Tumor means swelling. Tumor, swelling, ruber, redness. Pain and then calor. What was calor? Calor. Temperature. temperature. Yeah. Okay. Heat. Yeah. Temperature. Heat. So it was uh, calor, pain, ruber, and tumor. That's right. From Celsus, the Roman physician. That's right. Nice, nice, nice. You're 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 a creative mind, aren't you? Well, I think my partner and I are pretty creative. But there's your cocktail hour conversation starter. <laughs> if you remember that from dental school, you didn't drink enough beer in dental school. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. Huh. huh. Okay, so you talked about... Uh... Okay, then we go on to uh, HPV. So we have a test to detect the virus for HPV. We also have a test for herpes simplex virus. And I'll get back to that in a minute. We have a test for chlamydia and Neisseria. Basically, clap of the mouth because it does exist and people are, are worried about it. We have a test that identifies the different types of candida or yeast. Okay because it matters on your choice of antibiotics. And then lastly, um, we have oral cytology. So we can collect a sample and combine these molecular markers with what the cells actually look like. So let me give you a scenario. You've got an aphthous ulcer in the mouth. You presume that it's herpes simplex virus, right? But maybe it's actinomyces. Maybe it's actually an invasive candida infection. The difference between treating it with an antiviral versus an antibiotic or an anti, my, uh, antifungal is relevant. Now, the algorithm is 
you could test for herpes simplex virus. If it's negative, you presume it's a bacteria or a fungus. If you don't want to look at those things, go ahead and do oral cytology. Same oral rinse. We'll look at the cells. And if you find fungal elements under the microscope, you've got the diagnosis. You went from the clinical observation of a, of, of, of a sore in the mouth with the presumption that it's viral, but maybe not always. And then you use the laboratory to discern and establish the diagnosis. And now you have no reason to, to treat wrongly. You know, the, the BBC, uh, August of uh, 2016, ran an article um, that was posted on Dentaltown, Could Mouthwash Combat uh, Gonorrhea? And, uh, I mean, dentists, they, they need to get more in tune with this. I mean, and people were shocked to find out that I mean, dentists were shocked to find out that people are walking around with gonorrhea in their mouth and that Listerine actually is one of the uh, tools to uh, use uh, before and after oral sex to help combat gonorrhea. And dentists are literally at my seminars and they're like, uh, are you kidding me? I mean, they, they really got to change their mindset. You know, I, common things happen commonly and rare things happen rarely. And so back to our mission I mean, I have no pretense that there should be routine surveillance of chlamydia and gonorrhea from every patient you see, but you do run into patients here and then, and we want to be that laboratory service that addresses those needs when they arise. And correspondingly, over the last two years or so, the anecdotal cases of, I have a patient with, with oral thrush, but it won't go away, and I've tried metronidazole, I've tried amphotericin B, you know, and so on and so forth. And so I asked the question, do you know the species of candida that's involved? And they said, no, why would it matter? Because these different species harbor antibiotic resistance to variable degrees. Laboratory can give you that precise answer. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, you really got your work cut out, but I, I think you're doing I mean, you already have 6,000 dentists using you. Uh, you're on a podcast talking to several times that many. Um, I really hope you um, create an online C course to really go through this methodically. And um, and also, I really wish you and your partner would go on the uh, on the forums under the oral systemic link and start uh, chiming in on some of these questions. I mean, uh, uh, the, den the dentists have, I don't, they know what they know, but they don't know what they don't know. And they're 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 practicing in ancient times um that they, they need to get up to speed well i think i, I prefer to to say that um one of the ways we've tried to organize our business is to say that the laboratory is the resource but we really do a good job of trying to provide consultation on these kinds of questions and you'd be surprised at how many times i'm out bird dogging all kinds of unusual questions to help you know, facilitate that conversation, everything from rare genetic disorders. And where does that fit into the oral health picture that this hygienist or this dentist is seeing? I'm trying to provide some con con conversation as well as some lab results that make this a fuller, richer experience. And we take better, better care of patients. Well, you know, instead of answering that one-on-one, -on -one, you should tell them to ask you that on one thread. You should go to the oral systemic link and start a single thread. And say, you know what, I'll answer you, but I wish you would answer me, ask this on that thread. Because when you post a thread, then they can forward it to you. And then you'd answer that person, but then hundreds, if not thousands of others could start reading this. Because it's going to be, it's going to be. Deal. It's you gonna got a be deal. A, so, so what would you say to the dentist listening to you right now saying, with regards to cancer, uh, no, I don't need any of this. I've already got it covered. I, I got a Velscope. Uh, I got, you know, some of these oh, uh, Toluene Blue. Bellscope Technologies, what, what would you say to that, that, that dentist? Well, there's a couple aspects of it. Um, first of all, we know very deliberately that not all HPV infections are, are the same. So the Velloscope will identify established proliferations of cells. It doesn't specify whether or not the underlying viral cause, presuming there is a viral cause, is going to go off in the direction of, of, of a malignancy. So. To those listeners, I'll, I'll point out that HPV, it's much more common to find the so-called non-oncogenic or low-risk types in the oral cavity. And to those patients, you can say, we're going to snip it out, 
we're going to watch it, if it, but it's a low risk of cancer. Much, much more insidious are the infections that are the high risk. They are silent until they appear. And when they appear, they are typically established malignancies. And they're flat and they're not so clinically observable and the veloscope will miss them because they are in nooks and crannies that are not so obvious to find. So that's the first point. Test will reveal the relative risk. The other thing is, though, is that patients are interested in knowing about their baseline risk really early on, post-exposure, and often years in advance of any lesion being identified. Do them a favor and make this test available to them so that they receive those re results with professional counsel that goes with it. When you have two sisters that are nuns, you always think about the religious effect on the mind. And everyone knows you transmit diseases below the belt. But when you go into a dental office, they'll, they'll see a woman every three months for 10 years for gum disease. And they'll never have laid eyes on her husband. And I'm like, do you not realize that they're kissing in bed? Now, if, if they were seeing them every three months for chlamydia for 10 years, within 10 right. years, the doctor would say, hey, are you sleeping with someone with chlamydia? You know, can we get your husband in here? Uh, you know, I think your husband might be carrying this. But, but then, you, then, then, then the, a periodontist will look you in the eye and say, well, you, you can't uh, transmit periodontal disease and saliva. It's like, so you're saying that bug evolved there? What? When the, the kid was born, okay. periodontal, you know? Uh, spontaneous uh, yeah. erupt. What, some hundred million year old evolution took place on this infant's tongue? I mean, where yeah. the hell? I mean, if you saw a giraffe in the backyard, you'd know it came from somewhere. I mean, how <laughs> the hell could you not think that, you know, so these bugs and all kinds of bugs. Why, why do you, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get the dentist to say, no, I can't treat you for an oral disease unless I see who you're trading spit with. So I need you to bring in your husband, your boyfriend, the UPS man, the milk man. I need everybody you're making out with. Uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta treat the village. Well, I think this brings up the sort of the whole larger conversation about appreciating the biology of the oral microbiome. You're right, it doesn't come from outer space. <laughs> it's part of the environment. Sometime after we emerge from the womb, we acquire our own oral microbiome. One of the things we clearly see in all the patients we test is a, a very idiosyncratic signature of bacteria. No two persons are, are exactly alike. However, within selected bacteria, when you treat person A and you knock down bacteria B, and then they go home and come back three months later. And if you have the opportunity to test their spouse, their child, you will see the co-presence of that same bacteria. So we have clear evidence day to day in our laboratory that people share the same microbiome. And by the way, if you don't believe us, I can refer to an article that points out that even within our own household, we share it between our pets. And so we've done a study and actually within our own business, we have created a derivative or parallel division that tests for canine periodontal disease. Porphyromonas gulae is the bacteria that is the culprit in dog periodontal disease. But about 20% of dogs carry Porphyromonas gingivalis. And we have studies that demonstrate the transmission from pet owner to dog and back again. So it does occur. It's perfectly logical. And understanding that biology addresses why you need to see your patients recurrently, right? Once you clean them up, you knock those levels down, you lower the level of inflammatory burden. But as the biology would have it, these bacteria will grow back. And so that's why you need to see them again. And things change as a function of time. So you make an excellent point, Howard. And you know, these things are pretty obvious when you think you about know, it. You know, in my uh, 54 laps around the sun, I always see people kiss their dogs on the mouth, but I never see people do that to their cats. I've always had three cats. I, I've never seen a cat owner kissing the cat on the mouth, but you see it all the time with people on their dogs. Do you, do you think it's a bigger problem with dogs 
since dogs will come up and lick your face and and a cat is never going to come up to you and start really licking your face well i've uh lived uh, 30 laps around the sun uh with dogs but none of them have ever been my dog per se so i've sort of been one of those guys who encountered dogs uh, as an adult and wondered why anybody would kiss their dog but the point is they do and i think a lot of people kiss their dogs but let's get back to the point of cats a study from just uh, about three weeks ago made its way to the new york times and in the scientific literature that talks about the risk to pregnant women and to owners generally for two uh, concerns one is cat scratch fever, which is a classic, you know, prenatal concern. But the other is capnocytophagia, a series of bacteria which in periodontal disease is viewed as a low risk pathogen. But in some people, particularly those with some degree of immunosuppression, that could be a lethal bacteria. Well, cats carry this in great, great abundance. So if you kiss your cat, you have a risk of transmitting capnocytophagia and there's a series of species of those bacteria so a lot of us have it a lot of us get it from animals those who have cat have higher levels and, what, and it's concern and what is more toxic cat scratch fever or ted nugent who sang the song hmm depends on your political persuasion <laughs> but uh but uh i can see them equally being pathogenic oh he's uh that was not all my jokes are funny, but I, I try but it's, hard. It's hard, to, it's hard to dance the cat scratch fever, the disease. Yeah, and uh, that, that it is is amazing. Uh, um, you you see it in households all the time. I mean, I, I can't believe it. I mean, I cannot even comprehend how people have a newborn baby and the mom and dad are both dentists, and you see them in their house and two other dentists come over and they pick up the baby and they kiss it right on the mouth. And it's like, oh my God, the mom and dad are a dentist. The person that just came over for dinner is a dentist. And she just picked up a three month old baby and kissed it on the mouth. I mean, are, are, is, the, is the entire planet nuts? I mean, the whole planet after HIV understands that below the belt, you can kill each other. Right. But the planet doesn't get it because of religion, because below the belt is naughty and dirty and, and is a sin. But above <laughs> the belt, it's all clean. And I mean, I just can't believe that you see a dentist come over and kiss a dentist baby couple on the mouth. You're like, are you guys, did you guys miss microbiology class? I mean, the planet needs to stop doing this. <laughs> well, I, I would agree. And, um, I guess I've been indoctrinated into the more sort of horrific stories. And so I'll just recount one from my medical school years where um, sort of the classic professor who had done tropical medicine reminded us that on the hospital, the things that are killing our immunosuppressed patients, those you know, profound cases of bone marrow transplantation, you know, where did that child die of herpes simplex encephalitis? When grandma and grandpa kissed them. And how, are facts. and how many people die each year in America in the hospital, going in the hospital for something else, and then gets a disease that they caught at the hospital and that kills them? Well, that brings up another point. And if, if you will, let me just expound for a moment. Earlier this morning, I was listening to an article on the BBC that uh, seems to pronounce what the British are very concerned about, which is antibiotic resistance. Okay, and the story of where it all sort of came from is quite simple, but I'm not going to dwell on that. But I am going to point out that, again, in the spirit of community epidemiology and community health, the dentist sits in a privileged position to see the full spectrum of the community from young to old, sick to well, and from that same vantage of collecting a sample of saliva, you are in a position to identify who has methicillin-resistant Staph aureus and some of these other bacteria. These tests are soon to be forthcoming at oral DNA, and it'll do not only your patients a service, but the community a service as well. Um, my, my favorite uh, book on healthcare by a Pulitzer writing uh, guy was uh, Paul Starr in 84, The Rise of the American Healthcare System. Uh, it's one of the few books I only read twice. Another Pulitzer Prize on Guns, Germs, and Steel. That was another one I read twice. And he just wrote right. a new book called Sapiens. It's to die right. for. 
But uh, right. Paul Starr just came out with another one, Remedy in Action, the Peculiar American Struggle Over Healthcare. But I, got, I just want to tell you a real life story in uh, Arizona to tell you where we sit in time. So I'm in Phoenix. If I go to the Intel plant, those employees pull up in their cars, they go in, they take off all their clothes, they'll go shower, they'll go put on a uniform, a mask, deals. They'll walk into that chip factory, which is filters air below one part per billion because one piece of hair on that chip will kill the chip. And then you go across the street to Chandler Regional Hospital and the cardiovascular surgeon pulls up in his Porsche, gets out wearing his A6 shoes, walks through bird shit, dog shit, everything in the world, walks in the elevator, goes up, and then walks in there and then washes his hands 20 minutes like he's the Pope doing something with incense on an altar, and then walks in and fillets a man open, and he's got these little booties over his ASICs. It's like, why is Intel, why would you prefer to have open heart surgery at an Intel computer plant than in a hospital with a cardiovascular surgeon? I mean, it's like when you, and, and, then, and then when dentists have heart attacks or cancer, then, you know, we'll, I'll get a phone call like, oh, come on, we'll I'll pick you up. We're all going to go visit so-and-so. It's like, why would five healthy dentists all walk into a hospital where all the sickest people in Phoenix, Arizona are to go visit our buddy? I mean, isn't that a classic time to FaceTime him on his iPhone? I mean, and, and, and then they, they bring in their kids. It's like, are you kidding me? You just brought a two-year-old and a four-year-old, trudging them through a hospital to invent a friend. I mean, I mean, what what might he pick up? And then, then you have other friends who uh, the daughter went and visited grandma in the hospital. Now she's got this red rash all over her skin and her knee and her arm, and she got it ever since she visited grandma in the hospital. It's like, well, why did you take a two-year-old healthy kid into a building filled with diseases where everybody is set if they're sick and dying of something? I mean, we got such a long way to go on this mission. But hey, I want to tell you that um, I was so excited when you accepted my uh, invitation to be on this show, uh, Ron. I just think you're an amazing guy. I think this is um, the this is the this is the tomorrow we talked about yesterday. It's here. I'm so excited that you got six thousand of the two hundred eleven thousand dentists on board. I hope you do some online CE. I hope you get on the message boards and start talking to these guys about it. Um, um, what did you say your goal was to get 60, 50, half of the dentists or 60%? What was your goal? 60%, yeah, using lab tests. To get in, in what time frame? <laughs> My goodness, it gets shorter all the time. Let's say, let's, let's say five years. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do anything to help. I mean, I want, I want my, uh, I'd love to uh, come in to this uh, profession as a, a, a surgeon who works on molars and leave it as a physician of an oral mouth. I mean, I want to do my part to play on that. I mean, they, they, they need to become real doctors. They need to start, I, you know, I, I told Dennis, say, we, what if we all just start giving flu shots? I mean, what is the government going to do? Are they going to take away the license of 211,000 dentists? Why, why can't we act like the Teamsters and just say, this is absurd, we're giving flu shots? So either, yeah. either shut trend, us all down. They, What's that? The consumer are going to demand it. So convenience is the driver here economically and otherwise. And it's all about service. And uh, uh, we should put the patient first. So, hey, yeah. thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, I had a blast, Howard. Thank you very much. You're a great guy. All right. Thank you so much. Have a rock and Oh, last question. Are you just loving that 5-0 and Vikings and that new billion-dollar stadium? I mean, are you just grinning ear to ear every morning when you I wake am, up? I am, I'm an emerging Viking fan. Uh, the last time I was woken from that slumber was in the 70s. <laughs> well, I'm very jealous of your new stadium and your 5-0 record. So congratulations to all you Viking fans. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. <laughs>